every collector has a holy grail. For car collectors, it might be a Ferrari 250 GTO. For comic collectors, it could be some original artwork. Or how about a first edition of Harry Potter for book collectors? For Beatles collectors, it might be a gold stereo Please Please Me. Or a signed album. I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions, and this is one of mine, an original EMI Master Tape. I've always been fascinated by tape, and one of my earliest memories is listening to the 60s music my father had recorded on his reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, on this very player to be exact. Over the years, I've acquired a lot of reel-to-reel -reel tapes, most of them containing nothing more interesting than lo-fi recordings of pop music but some have contained lost radio programs and even some early BBC appearances by the Beatles. It's not just the excitement of coming across an interesting recording. I also love the physical and mechanical aspect of the format itself. It's the smell of the machines when they get warmed up and watching the reels go round is just as, if not more satisfying than playing records. In fact, there are many who would argue because it's the closest medium to the source that reel to reel tape is a better sounding format than vinyl. There's definitely no snap, crackle and pop with tape, and certainly no trace of inner groove distortion. But as with anything involving sound reproduction, the quality of the sound depends on the quality of your source. In the early days of reel-to-reel, -reel, the format was seen just as a rich man's toy. The first consumer pre-recorded tapes were limited and very expensive. In the UK, EMI was the first to produce commercial pre-recorded stereophonic reel-to-reel -reel tapes. These contained some of their finest classical titles, which predated their release on vinyl. These tape records, as they were called, were high quality two track tapes recorded at seven and a half inches per second. They were produced in quantities of between 500 and 1,000 only, and retailed between two pounds two shillings and four pounds four shillings each. Now that was a lot of money back then, and is the equivalent to 50 to 100 pounds or 60 to 120 dollars today. What made these tapes so great and so collectible today was that they were copied one to one in real time directly from the master tape. This was all done on a mini production line on the third floor of EMI's cabinet factory in Hayes on a couple of EMI's own BTR1 tape machines. But as the format became more popular, cheaper machines flooded the market and the price and quality of the tapes went down. EMI's pre-recorded tapes from 1962 onwards were slowed down to three and three quarter inches per second and were twin track mono only and were no match for the sound quality of the record. But the majority of people buying these new pop tapes were more interested in the music than the sound. Pre-recorded seven and a half inches per second tapes were produced in the US and some of those earlier ones sound great. Although EMI finally introduced four-track stereo tapes, it was too late to save the format, and production of pre-recorded reels in the UK ceased in 1970. They then turned all their attention on the cassette and eight-track, videos about which you can find elsewhere on this channel. But let's get back to this. This is a master tape of Let It Be. Now, of course, it's not the master tape. That's safely locked away inside the vaults at Abbey Road. It isn't even the full album. So what exactly do I have here and where did it come from? Well, this is a genuine production master tape of Let It Be, which was made at Abbey Road on January the 10th, 1972. It's housed in a blue and white Emmy tape box with a studio label stuck onto one side. The first thing you'll notice is that the running order is that of the cassette and eight track. So clearly this isn't a vinyl album master tape. In fact, the tape number is marked as being CCM27. Now, I don't know what that means exactly, but my guess is that CCM stands for Compact Cassette Master. In the matrix column number on the front, it says TCPCS7096, which was the UK cassette number. And the track list matches that cassette, which due to timing was different to that of the LP. Now, the cassette of Let It Be was originally released at approximately the same time as the record in the UK, which was in May 1970. At that time, only two other Beatles cassettes had been released, Sgt. Pepper and Abbey Road. So the number 27 clearly doesn't relate to the 27th Beatles tape. 
Also, I can just make out that this tape was copied in room 3 at 15 inches per second. The tape itself is Type 815, which was being used for all recordings by EMI at that time, including Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. It's marked, of course, as stereo, and this has an IEC equalization curve, which was the European equivalent to the North American NAB system. But where did this tape end up? The clue is on the back of the box. And it's this, an inlay from an Australian cassette. And here's an odd thing. As you can see from the note written in red ink, the tape has been reassembled back into the LP track order. And before it fell off, this Australian label was attached to the box. And that design was in use between April 1982 to June 1987. The original 1970 Australian pressing had been made using UK supplied metalwork or stampers. So it's possible that by the early 1980s they'd just worn out, and this cassette master was the only thing they had left. So if you have a copy of Let It Be with this label, do let me know in the comments how it sounds. But coming back to the tape itself, another question I had was what was the source for this tape? This is a picture of the original Let It Be master tape box from Abbey Road. It comes from the 1982 Beatles Collection Mobile Fidelity box set, a video about which you can also watch on this channel. Interestingly, it's marked as being a corrected copy tape. And looking at the copy log down the left-hand side, you can see that no copies were made of this tape between April the 28th, 1970 and April the 29th, 1976. So this tape can't have been copied from that reel. However, there is a note at the bottom which says that this tape is for cutting only. Use original master for tape copies, which is tape number AR16216. So maybe this tape was cut from that. My next big question was, of course, what does it sound like and does it still even play? But before I could do that, I had to find a machine to play it on. Now, I'm sure you've all noticed the reel-to-reel -reel player over my right shoulder, which is the 1966 twin-track Revox G36. It's a great machine, and being a twin-track model with the ability to handle the 10.5-inch reels would be an ideal choice to play this tape on. However, this particular model only has 3 and 3 quarters and 7.5 inches per second speed options. I do have another machine, which is this Revox A77 Mark IV, but being a 4-track machine, it's even less suited to the job. Now, one solution would be to play the tape on the G36 at 7.5 inches per second, and then speed it up using some audio software. But the problem with that is that the EQ on playback would be way off. So to make sure I got everything I could out of this tape, I needed to get hold of something a bit more serious. And this is what I got. It's a Revox B77 Mark I. It's a twin track machine, but more importantly, it can play tapes at 15 inches per second. Now this tape has been stored in the box like all professional studio tapes, tails out, which means in order to play it, I'll have to rewind it first. I was expecting a tape such as this to have the standard 1 kHz test tone, followed by 15 seconds of silence. But there's nothing like that. However, I've never been so glad to hear John shout, I dig a pygmy. Now I know what a drag it is that YouTube won't let me play you anything from this tape, but as it turns out, the RX software I'm going to show you tells us more than if we were to actually listen to it. Fortunately, any tape from this period is very stable, and the tape played through fine. And as I mentioned before, this tape was reassembled at some point from the original cassette configuration to the LP running order. And thankfully, all the splices held together as I recorded it onto the computer. Now, rather than look at the tape as a whole, I thought it would be best just to look at one track in detail. And what better one than Let It Be itself. One of the things I'm interested in with this tape is how it sounds in comparison to the original vinyl. And what, if anything, is different about a cassette master as opposed to a vinyl cutting master? So let's do some comparisons, and this is what I'm going to use. First, of course, is the recording from the reel itself, then a recording from a UK first vinyl pressing with the initial 2U cutting, a recording from this original 1970 first issue cassette, 
And finally, a recording from the original UK pre-recorded mono reel-to-reel. -reel. So here's the waveform of the track Let It Be from this master tape reel. The blue area is the waveform, and the orange colour behind it is the spectrograph, which measures the frequencies from just over 20 kHz at the top to just below 100 Hz at the bottom. Simply put, the brighter the orange colour, the louder the sound is at that frequency. Now below that, I'm going to put up the waveform of the UK first vinyl pressing. And right away, you can see how different it is. The front section here, which is the introduction of first verse, is much quieter than the version above, which overall has a much more consistent volume level throughout. The size of the waveform, especially in the quieter sections, suggests that this cassette master reel has been intentionally mastered at a higher level than the vinyl cutting tape. This, no doubt, was to compensate for the cassette's much higher noise floor. Don't forget, this was copied pre-Dolby. OK, now let's replace the vinyl version with a recording from the first issue UK cassette. As you can see, it's very similar to the reel above. In fact, it's virtually identical. The only real difference is, is that the cassette has a high frequency cutoff at around 15k, with the orange haze above that point being just tape noise. Finally, here's a recording from the mono reel-to-reel, -reel, which again has a virtually identical waveform to the master reel, with just a touch more high frequency response and less hiss than the cassette. Therefore, I think we can confirm that this is indeed a copy of the original UK cassette duplication master. Now that may sound a bit second rate, but the sound quality really is amazing. It's like listening in another dimension. The magic is all in those mid-range frequencies, and it brings out textures and colours in the music I've never heard before. All I need to do now is find side two. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you have any similar Beatles tapes in your collection, I know myself and everybody else would love to hear about them in the comments. I'll be doing more videos about the Beatles on Tape in the future, but in the meantime, do check out our Beatles on Tape playlist, a link to which is coming up on the end screen, and you can also find it in the description. I'll see you again next week for some more interesting Beatles stuff. But that's all for this one, so I'll say bye for now, and thanks for watching.